ladies and gentlemen, uh, so you are very, very welcome at our science popularizing lecture. I will introduce that uh, that image actually, which you have seen at Facebook and YouTube. Uh, please allow me actually to welcome once again, uh, Professor Laszlo Kutsi, who is actually a professor at Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Professor Kutsi will give today a lecture about the basics of game theory and will introduce us to a historical overview uh, to this interesting marriage of mathematics and economics. I would like to welcome His Eminence, Dr. Tomáš Ivan Kovács, uh, plenipotentiary ambassador of Hungary in Belgium and Luxembourg. And uh, actually uh, our ambassador will introduce today's lecture. You may send your questions via chat and they will be raised in a summarized form at the end of the presentation. In the name of our club and my helping colleague, Dr. Janka Matre, I wish you a very pleasant evening and apologize the delay. So uh, once again, I wish you a, a very pleasant learning in a distant, math, distant way. Dear Ambassador, the microphone and, uh, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, and a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, it seems that uh, tonight's premiere is not without uh, any complications. Uh, of course, those who follow us on YouTube will hear uh, whatever we have to say in the beginning twice. Uh, but we wanted to uh, be polite to our Facebook audience and we decided to uh, start uh, from all over and then uh, you can benefit uh, from everything, uh, not just our uh, pictures, but our voice um, and the content of the presentations again. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kozi, uh, the members of the Belgian Club of Hungarian Scientists, very warm welcome to all of you who joined us tonight uh, on the virtual platforms of the Hungarian Cultural Institute in Brussels. My name is Tomáš Ivan Kovács, and I'm the ambassador of Hungary to Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, I, that, those are two, two countries of my accreditations, and I'm resident in Brussels, uh, as well as the embassy and the Cultural Institute. I have the special honor uh, to open tonight's uh, virtual science club and to welcome you to its online event uh, entitled From Rock, Paper, Scissors to the European Parliament's Politics, a lecture about game theory by Professor Laszlo Akotzi. Since 2013, uh, the Hungarian Cultural Institute, the cultural service of our embassy, in collaboration with the Belgian Club of Hungarian Scientists, brings the latest research projects of Hungarian scientists to you. Today's event is the Jubilee 40th lecture in the history of the Science Club, and I was wondering uh, during the previous version of this introduction uh, and comparing it to a happy event of a 40th marriage anniversary. But it is unfortunate uh, that we still cannot celebrate this occasion in person. We cannot toast a glass of fine Hungarian wine to mark the moment, in addition to quenching our thirst for science and information. However, for this occasion, and this is the premiere for our science club, as I mentioned, we broadcast a lecture on YouTube as well, where you might find the recorded lectures of our previous guests, so both YouTube and Facebook. As I mentioned before, our guest lecturer for tonight is Professor Dr. Laszlo Akotzi, who will present his works on game theory. As you might know, game theory could qualify as a Hungaricum, as it was started by Janos Neumann, uh, John von Neumann, and had Janos Károly Harsányi, John C. Harsányi, among its first Nobel laureates. Today's guest, Professor Dr. Kotzi, is one of the leading researchers of the field in Hungary. After graduating from the University of Cambridge reading mathematics, he obtained his master's degree at the Catholic University of Leuven, KU Leuven, in economics, where he also completed his PhD under the supervision of Professor Luc Lauers with the title Solution Concepts and Outsider Behavior in Coalition Forming Games. He was vice dean at the Obuda University where he also won the prestigious Momentum Grant of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 2011 to establish the Game Theory Research Group at the Institute of Economics. Currently, he is professor at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, the director of the Research Center for Quantitative Social and Management Sciences, also offering courses at the Milestone Institute and the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, and works as scientific advisor at the Center for Economic and Regional Studies of the Etwish Loran Research Network. 
Tonight, Professor Kutsi will speak about game theory's many applications in our daily life, from the simple examples such as chess or our everyday little conflicts in sharing a cake, raising kids, or applying to college, but also showing its presence in the decision-making of the Council of the European Union or the European Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a pleasant evening and a great discovery. Professor Kotsi, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this uh, kind introduction, these kind words. So let me start uh, my presentation sharing my uh, screen. I hope it's uh, visible. So the, indeed the title of my talk is uh, From Rock, Paper, Scissors to European Parliament Politics. Um, and indeed we'll come to Rock, Paper, Scissors, but first a few words about who are game theorists. So many people associate game theory uh, with the world of casinos. They, they think that game theorists are uh, uh, you know, rich men uh, uh, winning in the, the roulette uh, every weekend. Um, that's not exactly the, the situation and the, the case, unfortunately. Or perhaps we are very good in uh, in games, in uh, perhaps computer games, or we are the ones who are designing games. Well, there, there must be some science behind designing games that is not game theory. Uh, at last, uh, sometimes if you look for the keywords game theory, you will end up at uh, websites uh, discussing uh, sports games. Uh, and in this, in this context, uh, game theory is, is uh, seen as the, is the, the theory behind uh, doing well in, uh, in sports games, especially team sports. Well, when it comes to sports, uh, perhaps uh, if that's a sport, uh, chess is the closest to, to the problems that game theory studies, uh, even though uh, even for chess, it was not clear until the early 20th century that game and that uh, mathematics could uh, could be relevant for the study of such uh, situations. So we must go back to the end of the 19th century uh, to, to find the roots of game theory. And um, one author uh, identified the Central European coffee culture as the reason for the development of game theory, because at the time people spent their evenings rather than playing with their mobile phones, uh, playing uh, games, chess, backgammon, and, and other uh, parlor games in, in cafes. Um, and then they had some ideas uh, on how, how to play uh, well in these games. Uh, although at the time, it was not completely clear if there's really uh, a mathematical model could help um, one in such situations. In fact, Emmanuel Lasker, who was the ruling world champion uh, at the time, in fact, for a very long time, uh, argued that uh, there's no uh, best move. Well, he thought that if there is a best move, then his opponent could uh, prepare uh, a good reaction to that, a, a good counter move, and therefore um, the basically the surprise effect of the move would be gone. And um, his strategy was to uh, make unexpected moves, confuse the opponents, and then psychologically dominate the game. So. Um, a couple of years later, Zermelo, on the other hand, uh, claimed the mathematical claim that if players would play perfectly, then either black uh, should always win or white should always win, or there should be a draw in chess. So the, the, the question was still there if mathematics is useful for winning or, or at all to evaluate these kind of games. Well, von Neumann, George von Neumann was interested in poker and uh, him being a very good uh, uh, theoretician, a good mathematician um, thought that he could develop some kind of a model of how to play this game. And even if the model is complicated, he could do the calculations in head and then would do well um, in poker. Well, um, so basically the question here to answer first is, is poker a game of chance where um, the question is what kind of a deal you get and this will uh, uh, decide the, the, your fate in the game is it a game, is it the psychological game, like Lasker claimed for chess, where you can perhaps uh, shock your opponent with a, by, by bluffing uh, in a, with a certain strategy? Or is it a strategic game where perhaps clever decisions can give you a, a, a better chance of winning? Well, so he thought he could develop a model of, of bluffing, uh, in a mathematical model for bluffing, and while I, we don't really know how far he got with poker, and certainly he's not uh, best known for his achievements in poker, uh, 
1928, he proved something that is known today as the Minimax theorem. This theorem basically says that there is an objective evaluation of certain types of, of strategic conflicts, including chess or, or, or poker. But at the time, this was more a theoretical um, a model uh, with, uh, with uh, no practical applications in mind. It uh, took uh, a few more years. Um, uh, and the co-author Oscar Morgenstern, an Austrian uh, mathematician, uh, um, economist rather, uh, to, to develop uh, economic applications of game theory. And in 1944, they published the book, which is really the, the cornerstone of game theory today, Game Theory and Economic Behavior. 50 years later, this field grew up and was recognized by the Nobel Prize of John Nash, uh, John C. Horshányi, Hungarian uh, by birth, and Reinhard Zelten. Um, well, since then, game theory has expanded even further. Now we can talk about really a, 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 a major subject. In 1999, a game theory society was established. Uh, this first uh, Nobel Prize was followed by uh, several others, including uh, the one last year given to Milgram and Wilson. And um, to keep the Hungarian connection, uh, while well, we were planning to have the, the World Congress of the Game Theory Society in Budapest to celebrate the 100th anniversary of John C. Harshanyi, well, unfortunately, due to the epidemic, it had to be postponed, but we are going to have it in the end of July in, in Budapest in some hybrid form. Okay, so what is Game Theory uh, good for? Well, I would say that modern microeconomics that is used as the, the, the grounds for uh, antitrust policies um, and, 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 and the wide range of models uh, and industrial organization is based on game theory, where we look at strategic conflicts between firms. So the strategy is still there, but the conflict is between firms. So the players are the firms. Of course, it can be used in military. And perhaps the first uh, uh, best known example is um, that um, Neumann and his uh, colleagues solved the Cuban Missile Crisis in a, in a peaceful way basically avoiding a, a third world war. Perhaps the largest scale uh, application is um, university admissions. In many countries, uh, algorithms um, um, that are, are kind of used to, to match uh, students with preferences over programs and universities with preference over students are based on certain models of game theory, in particular it's called matching theory. Now let's see what the, the rest of the talk is about. Um, when uh, I was uh, asked to, to give a presentation, I, I proposed that I, I could either talk about really everyday issues that where game theory pops up, or perhaps uh, talking uh, in Brussels, even if, if, if virtually, perhaps some applications to the European Union could be interesting. Well, I was given the idea that perhaps I should talk about both, so I will talk uh, a bit of both. Uh, starting with some simple examples from everyday life. So the game theory starts with a simple problem, how to share a cake, how to share a cake in a fair way. Well, the, the common approach to this, which uh, out of uh, experience, we know that it's, it, 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 it works, is that one divides and the other person chooses. This should work. So why does it work? Well, in this case, we have some, something like a zero sum game. It's actually a constant sum game where uh, basically we have to share the cake and we cannot both win by, uh, by uh, dividing uh, in a different way. So if this is the case, then uh, the first player, while trying to find the right cut, tries to minimize losses and thereby tries to cut the cake into two equal parts. Well, that's the whole point of the model. And this is exactly what Minimax theorem says, is to um, maximizing the minimum one can get uh, when it comes to the one of the parts of the cake. And basically what Neumann proved is that this the Minimax and the Maximin are the same. I don't want to go into some mathematical details or, or spell this out in more detail, but in, uh, in, uh, in human terms, it means, in plain English, it means that uh, if you want to evaluate the game from the perspective of one player or the other player, then we will come to the same kind of a fair solution of the game. Um, 
uh, it is actually called a saddle point. So we have curves going uh, all like this, so like U-shaped curves, and we have inverted U-shaped curves in the other direction, and where the, the, the lowest uh, inverted U-shaped curve will be at the same place as the highest uh, U-shaped curve. And this is actually the, the saddle point of the problem. Neumann basically claimed that all such games have a, all games have a value, and this is actually given by this minimax or maximum situation. Now let's go to rock, paper, scissors. Well, for rock, paper, scissors, I've written the, the game in a slightly different form, although it, it could be even simpler. Uh, I hope everybody knows the game. It's uh, uh, two players uh, showing at the same time, uh, well, each of them a hand in the shape of a rock, a paper, a scissor. And we know that uh, the paper can wrap rock, so it's stronger. Scissors can cut the paper, so the scissor is stronger. And finally, um, uh, the, the, the uh, rock can damage the scissors and therefore the rock is stronger than the scissors. So we have this loop of uh, um, among these alternatives. Now, if you would look at this game in some detail, um, we, we could find that there is actually no saddle point in this game. So there is something beyond uh, the, this, uh, the, the simpler situations that uh, Neumann has shown. We'll come to this game uh, uh, back in a minute although we will not provide a complete solution. Now, um, this is not what will help us to solve uh, the rock, paper, scissors game directly, but um, uh, if we step into uh, the world of slightly more general situations, we can have situations with win-win uh, uh, strategies. Uh, well, in this case, it will be more like, oh, it will seem like more like lose-lose strategies, but anyway, the, the, the most famous game a simple game uh, that we can have is the so-called prisoner's dilemma. So the story uh, goes, um, there is a, a robbery and there are two criminals who are caught uh, with a very good suspicion that they have taken part in this, uh, in this robbery. There is some kind of a petty crime for which they could be charged. And um, the, the police comes up with this clever scheme. Let's try to question them in separate rooms. And uh, when they ask one of the, the, the criminals, he has absolutely no idea what the other said in the other room. So basically the criminals have two possible strategies. Well, deny the whole thing, that's number one. And second is talk. By talking, we mean that they provide evidence that could help to uh, put the other criminal into jail. Um, and of course, this goes both ways. So what can they do in this situation? So let's assume that Harry will deny. Okay, Harry is the one on the on the right hand side. So Marv has two possibilities: either deny as well, in which case they are they are both charged with a one year prison sentence, or in exchange for his cooperation, he's set free uh, on the same day uh, by uh, after his talking. Of course, talking is better in this case. What if Harry talks? If Harry talks then uh, denying means that the whole, everything is blamed on Marv, and therefore Marv gets a 10-year prison sentence while talking, uh, they both get nine years. Talking is again better. So in this case, irrespective of what Harry does, uh, Marv is better off talking. As a matter of fact, the game is symmetric, and therefore we can have the same argument for Harry from Harry's perspective, and we find that they will both talk and end up in a, with a prison sentence of nine, nine years. Well, this is actually um, what we have found here is a so-called Nash equilibrium. Um, there are obviously much more general games than this one. And the idea is that each player tries to find the best response to other strategies. So in this case, if talking is a strategy of Harry, then it is best for Marv to talk as well and vice versa. Um, Actually, there are many, many situations where we hide this kind of, we find this kind of prisoner's dilemma situation. The game is interesting because if they would both deny, they would both get off with a shorter prison sentence. So there's obviously the question how to, how to avoid uh, this inferior outcome. Um, and unfortunately, generally there are no uh, rules. There are many situations where, where this kind of inferior outcome comes out. I mean, just think about, uh, um, you know, in the morning when you pick whether you drive to work or you take a public transport to work, 
if if everybody would take uh, public transport, then I guess it would be very efficient and very quick. Um, now we are in in, in traffic jams, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we just follow these best responses in the game, and uh, for each of the players, then we can find the so-called pure strategy Nash equilibria of this game. Um, Nash, I haven't talked about him yet, only mentioned his uh, name with the um, equilibrium. Uh, Nash from the movie, The Beautiful Mind, uh, proved that every finite game has a Nash equilibrium. It basically means that every finite game can be solved uh, in some way. Um, if you look at the rock, paper, scissors game, there, there seems to be no obvious, um, uh, we, we do not really find uh, uh, a pair of strategies so that each are best responses to the other one. Well, the reason is that there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. We have to consider so-called mixed strategies, which just means that we have to randomly choose different strategies. In this case, it, it, we actually have to specify also how randomly do we choose these strategies? In this case, it's actually one third, one third, one third probability. So um, this makes uh, uh, this game a little bit difficult if you if you start to develop some kind of strategies. People people say things like picking stone first should always work. Well, if that's your strategy, you will probably lose more often than uh, than win. Okay, now let's look at some uh, more uh, uh, daily problems. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that I'll talk about uh, issues related to raising kids. So how about the following? The house rule is that kids can watch TV if housework, as well, if ho homework is done. Well, you see the kid is watching the TV already because homework's done. Maybe he haven't had any. Um, so maybe the parent would be quite surprised uh, seeing the, the, the kid uh, watching TV already so early. So um, how, to, how to make sure that the, the, the kid is, is honest in this uh, uh, situation? Well, one possibility is to monitor him. This is obviously something costly. I mean, having to check the child's uh, homework every day is something that uh, not uh, parents don't normally like to do. Um, so basically, the two parties now have the following strategies. The dad can choose whether he wants to check the homework, whether he trusts the kid. The boy has two options. You know, he can be honest or he can be shifty, right? Um, so let's just go through uh, the different situations. If uh, the boy is honest, obviously he has little time to watch TV because he has, he has to spend more time on doing his homework. But if dad checks, he will be happy because homework is done. Um, if uh, dad trusts the boy that's even better because on the one hand uh, the the boy prepares the homework on the other hand the dad has nothing to do with that he has no no extra duties regarding this what about the shifty shifty uh, uh, son um well for the dad to check the homework of a shifty son is is difficult because uh, well he has to go through everything some things are okay some other things are not okay um, obviously this kind of monitoring will be imperfect uh, so the, the kid can either watch a lot of TV or if, he, or if he's uh, uh, caught uh, with an incomplete homework, then he might get some kind of a ban on, uh, on watching TV. Um, if dad trusts the kid, the shifty kid, well, this will be a, obviously a stressful thing because he never knows when the homework is done. On the other hand, the, 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 the boy can watch a lot of TV for sure. So how to... How to uh, 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 find the first of all the equilibrium but it turns out that assuming that uh, uh, the dad is not able to check homework very thoroughly each time and and uh, and uh, find out if uh, the if there is something missing uh, it will be better to be shifty for the for the boy now um one of the reasons is that the kid might be underestimated the chance, uh, the chance of getting taught, so, so he may remain shifty. But one thing we can do is to make punishments more severe. Well, this may or may not work. Uh, kids don't uh, necessarily understand or realize these, the long-term consequences. So you could say, okay, don't watch TV for a week or something like that, but uh, um, on the spot, 
watching TV rather than doing the homework may be more tempting. So the discounting, so to say, is a bit uh, uh, different. Or what we can do is we can change the game. Let's say you have to study two hours minimum each day. Uh, and then it's up to you how you use this time. So the honest boy is going to do the homework properly within two hours. He should do most of it, especially at this age, like this guy in the, in the picture. So that means that afterwards he can watch some TV plus uh, get an A at school or be shifty and not do the homework during the study time. So he can watch the same amount of, well, sort of little TV, but at the same time get a bad grade. Okay, well, in this case, if you just compare these two, uh, perhaps we can push the boy towards uh, being honest. Now, this is not only child's pay, it's, it's a general problem how to monitor uh, people doing their, their duties. The so-called principal agent models are de dealing with this. So if agents, so the principal is somebody who, for instance, the owner of a company who trusts the agents with some job uh, and the agent has to deliver. But what if the agent works too little, doesn't, doesn't work hard enough? Well, we have to do some kind of incentives. But when there are incentives, the effort might be distorted. So for example, in the university life of a university or university staff, um, there are two things one can do, do teaching or research. Well, um, it's actually funny because in, in uh, for instance, the US people say that people do too little teaching because only research appears on their CVs and therefore they are motivated to do that well. In Hungary, it works sometimes uh, the other way around. If you do extra teaching, you get paid for that, you get paid extra. Well, this is not the case for research and therefore people tend to do too little research. Um, so according to this Dilbert uh, uh, cartoon, if uh, the idea is that your compensation will be based on achieving you know, certain goals, then uh, the employees are going to focus on that and basically ignore everything else that are that is uh, told to them to uh, uh, beyond those that 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 are incentivized. Actually, um, uh, Hart and Holmstrom got a Nobel Prize for developing these principal agent models a few years ago. Now back to the kids. Let's look at uh, promises. Well, family goes on a trip. Um, and uh, the mother says, if you don't behave, then we will not go hiking. Right. Well, they, of course, they know that the mother likes hiking. So even if they don't behave, the mother is not going to cancel this cool trip. Okay. So what to do about that? So is this a promise or an empty threat? Well, so let's look at the dilemma of this girl. She can do two things. Well, either she starts poking uh, her brother or leave the brother alone. If she leaves the brother alone, there's no problem. We have a peaceful trip. Everybody's having a great time. Um, that's nothing extra. What happens if she starts poking uh, her brother? Well, mom promised that if uh, she pro pokes the brother, then they will stay at home. So then we have a situation where there has been some poking, maybe to the benefit of the, the, the girl. I don't know, maybe that's something that they drive to. Uh, derive uh, benefits from, but at the same time, they stay at home. Or mother revises her idea and decides not to punish, even though poking was quite obvious. So there's some poking and there's some trip, while well, you can imagine the rest. Okay, and then comes Reinhard Selten, uh, one of the first Nobel Prize winners, who says, well, this is not going to be good because this is a situation where the promise is becoming an empty threat. Well, instead of staying at home, mom should come up with something that she finds interesting, but perhaps is considered an inferior option compared uh, to the trip, at least for the kids. Um, I'm sure there are lots of kids who love museums, but I'm sure there are museums also that are perhaps uh, not so uh, interesting for them. So going to a museum rather than staying at home is, a, is an option mother can uh, consider. So in this case, the punishment is to go to the museum rather than for the trip. And then uh, Zelton is happy with this, uh, with this argument. So this kind of a sanction can work if it is credible. This kind of subgame perfectness that uh, is a former property I'm, I'm not going to introduce now. Um, 
it must be a punishment. So obviously it won't work if kids love the museums. Uh, the mother must have some reputation for actually implementing uh, the, the sanctions. And uh, last but not least, the crime must be uncovered. Ideally, we should have a doomsday machine like this uh, nuclear missile uh, at the back, which is automatic, an unstoppable mechanism, and its existence is common knowledge. So these are all important. So the retaliation goes automatically. It's unstoppable, so you cannot revise this. The, in the same way as mom would uh, rather go for a trip even with the poking. But it is very important to have this as a common knowledge. That means that everybody knows that uh, it's there and everybody knows that everybody knows this. Because the goal is prevention. It's not to, to actually launch a counter strike, but, but really to prevent the primary attack. Okay. Well, um, if you want to raise kids in a, in a, in a, in a, in a good way, perhaps uh, you, you, don't, you don't really need uh, nuclear missiles to do that, but sometimes um, the, the sanction introduced can be uh, the uh, uh, friendly neighbor next door uh, or something like that who can uh, uh, monitor the kids uh, very carefully and will say her opinion immediately. Um, okay. So this is about family matters. Now let's move on to uh, uh, open the field up a little bit. So, so far I have been talking about games that are called non-cooperative in the, in the literature. So what is the difference between cooperative and non-cooperative games? They both have players, okay? But while in non-cooperative games, you could talk about strategies like uh, denying and talking or poking or not poking, uh, these kind of things. In cooperative games, these strategies are implicit. So they are, we don't really discuss them. It's more the, the outcome that matters. In a cooperative game, we have a rule of law. It is possible to make agreements, while in non-cooperative games, it's really the rule of jungle, uh, if you like. So people just try to use their elbows to make space, uh, get a higher payoff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so really this world is driven by selfishness, while in the cooperative game, uh, we, we have ideas of fairness, okay? How much should a player get out of, uh, out of a game? And because of this, in cooperative games, we can have coalitional games where a group of players act together. While in the non-cooperative games, we really have lone wolves. Um, cooperation is in theory possible, but it's very complicated. And therefore, uh, situations where you can have some cooperative elements are typically not studied by uh, non-cooperative games. Unfortunately, cooperative games are a bit more uh, theoretical, so I'm going to talk about this uh, just a little bit. But first, what we have to understand are coalitions. So a coalition is a group of players acting together. So the idea is that individually, they might have some strengths, but when you put together, you gain something extra. And the question is how to share this extra. So this joint coalitional payoff I use some notation here because I'm going to have a formula on the next slide, but uh, you don't need to memorize these things. Um, but once we have these coalitions, the question is, who is going to cooperate with whom? Which, which kind of coalitions are emerging in a game and how do they share the proceeds? So one way to solve these kind of games, and this is the concept that is very much motivated by fairness, is the so-called Shapley value also named after a Nobel Prize winner, Lloyd uh, S. Shepley. So the idea is that players arrive in some order. Uh, already a group of players is there. They have some kind of a value. And then somebody says, okay, let me join the project as well. Okay, I'm good in this and that. And I, I, will, I will add, uh, uh, I, I can translate between Hungarian and, uh, and Flemish, and therefore I can, I can help two subgroups of the team uh, to cooperate. Um, and then um, this newcomer can keep the extra that he brought in, into this uh, coalition. This is called the marginal contribution of that, uh, of that uh, newcomer. Now, of course, I said players arrive in some kind of an order. But which order? Well, any order would be possible. So let's just assume that it's a random order. Or put it differently, we look at the average of all possible orders and the average marginal contributions a player can get. And this is actually the Shapley value. 
Okay, so it basically says that if you would uh, randomly decide in which order the players come, what is your expected uh, uh, contribution to the coalition? And this formula, it's a slightly different story. It has a, a combinatorial um, reworking, but this formula says this uh, precisely. It's a not the most obvious formula, but it's uh, simple enough uh, so that it can be used for a wide range of problems. Okay, now let's move into voting situations. Now, voting situations are very special kinds of games where we have these coalitions, but the coalition can either have a zero payoff or a payoff of one corresponding to losing and winning coalitions. So those who win succeed, get a payoff of one, those who lose get a payoff of zero. So how do we how do we have how do we decide who is winning and who is losing? So one example is to consider weighted voting. So in this case, we have uh, voters, these are the players, they have voting weights. Okay, so for example, we can have a shareholder meeting where the shareholders are the players and the number of owned shares is actually the, the weight of, um, uh, of, of a player. And then there is some kind of a decision mechanism that decides which coalitions are winning. So for example, for certain decisions, you might require that at least two thirds of the shares are supporting the motion. Um, such games are called simple games. And again, we can solve this using the Shapley value to calculate how, how much share of the, 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 the total power a particular player can get. Well, in this context, we call the Shapley value shapley schubig index. And um, this is what we are going to use uh, uh, the rest of the presentation. So let me just give you one simple example. Consider an apartment building with four flats. They have 130, 105, 105, and 60 square meters. Um, in total, that's 400, so a majority requires at least 201 square meters. Um, basically, um, ownership of, the, of the, the common grounds is proportional to your uh, ownership um, in, in, uh, in apartments. Okay, so you don't need to go through all the numbers. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is that if the apartments are labeled A, B, C, D, then the following coalitions um, with their area, the total area highlighted in red, are winning. So those are the coalitions that if there is a there's a general meeting of the apartment building, those coalitions can actually uh, enforce a, a, a motion. So I don't know if you want to um, replace a, a, a window, then B and C get together. Together they have 210, so they will support this motion, and the house uh, must accept if the rule is simple majority. What you might notice in this game is that the roles A, B, and C, so the three larger apartment owners play, is completely symmetric. So the fact that, the, that A has a slightly larger apartment doesn't make any dip, doesn't translate into greater power. Okay, any two uh, of these larger owners um, could 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 pass um, uh, a, a motion. On the other hand. D is never swing. So what is swing? It, D is never able to turn a losing coalition into a winning coalition. It's never the case that without D, uh, they are losing, but with D, they are winning. So actually, if you look at, for instance, this ABD coalition, well, notice that AB is already winning, but so it's, it's uh, the addition of D didn't bring anything. So if we talk about the, the, the contribution of D, it's always zero. So as a result, Z, uh, D has zero power. It's a so-called null player, while the first three players share power equally. So the shapley schubig index of this game is one third, one third, one third, and zero. This might be an interesting lesson if you ever consider buying a small uh, flat in an apartment building. It might turn out that you think you have some word in uh, deciding things, but uh, it seems uh, you, you only have a... a the possibility to agree to other things. Um, I was tempted to bring another example, but maybe I say just a few words about that. Actually, when in 1958, the predecessor of the European Union was formed with six uh, member states, Luxembourg was actually in a very similar position. Luxembourg, according to the, uh, the formal uh, decision-making process, never had a chance in influencing uh, decisions. Uh, this is something that was discovered only later by the time the rules have changed, uh, 
the, the, the EC expanded and then it didn't matter anymore. Now, what is the situation right now? So in the European Union, there's a very complex decision-making uh, process. I'm sure there are people in the audience who, who know it a lot better than I do. Um, I think the main idea is that the, the Commission makes a proposal and then both the Council, the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament must vote. And if either of them rejects the proposal, then there is some kind of free negotiation and then the loop continues until basically um, the proposal is accepted. Now we are going to focus on uh, decision making in the Council. Um, so this is um, a, a voting body where every member state of the European Union has a single vote, uh, but that vote is somehow weighted according to the size of the country in a very complicated way. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. So basically what we would like to understand here is um, what is the influence of countries in this, uh, in this council? So generally we can say that if a member country is often swing, so if it's often the country that turns a losing coalition into a winning coalition, be the, 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 the matter of uh, discussion, anything actually, well then this country can stand up to its interests. So this country might say, well, I'm, I'm inclined to support this motion only if you change this uh, you know, uh, detail in, in, in my favor. And then if this is the case, then this country has a high sharply shubic index, but on the other hand, by being able to um, stand up to the interests, the country is going to have a higher share from the budget. There is some academic literature that shows this evidence, the link between the, the, the voting power and the, and the share from the budget. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about two aspects of that. One due to the Lisbon Treaty, which changed the rules the rules uh, uh, quite a bit, and then the effect of Brexit um, in this voting. So before the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the rules of Nice applied. So uh, the majority of the countries had to support a motion containing at least 62% of the population. But in addition to that, each country had a weight and they had to have 74% of the weights. Now these weights have been decided fairly arbitrarily as a result of political discussions. <clears throat> but for instance, uh, it was always a very touchy issue for the Dutch. Uh, the Netherlands had the same weight as Belgium, despite the fact that uh, the population-wise, the two countries uh, uh, had a, quite a difference um, by uh, 2007. So there was always a, some kind of an opposition between small and large countries in this model due to the very different weights. Uh, because these quotas were so high, it was very difficult to make decisions. So if you think about this in a situation where the majority is required to pass a motion, uh, well, either the proposers or the opposition is going to have majority. So that means that half of the coalitions are winning. In this case, only 2% of the coalitions were winning, making EU level decision making extremely difficult. And the, the weights were arbitrary, uh, making it very difficult to uh, to make it uh, you know, palatable for, uh, for member states. Not to mention the fact that every extension required a renegotiation of this. Now, the Lisbon Treaty abolished these, uh, these weights and therefore it's, uh, it's, in a sense, it's more fair and it's a long-term concept so that if there's a new member state or one uh, existing member state leaving, uh, the, 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 the method could carry over without difficulties. At the same time, the ability to act increased tremendously, so from 2% to 13%, making EU decision-making a, a lot faster. I'm not sure if it's realized actually in, in a, a more dy dynamic decision-making, but that was the idea. What uh, perhaps doesn't show from the numbers that much, so while previously the weight determined um, the, uh, the power primarily, now population is the driving uh, factor, so demographic trends matter a lot. Uh, this is a more fair method as well uh, to allocate uh, power, but there was a proposal from some Polish uh, uh, scientists, the so-called Jagello compromise, which was uh, not really considered even though mathematically that was the fair or that would be the fair um, allocation of, of powers. So what are the effects? So let me just give you some, uh, uh, um, some, some figures. I um, colored the countries of the European Union by four colors. Um, one representing the central states, uh, the Benelux, uh, France, and Germany. 
uh, one for the southern countries, one for the Eastern European countries, one for Athens, with a small difference that the Balkans are now have been uh, attached to the Nordic countries. Um, that seems to be the, the, the stronger connection nowadays. And while these countries, in uh, before the implementation of the Lisbon Treaty, had about the same uh, uh, power, so each of them about one quarter of power, um, the Lisbon Treaty, the introduction of the Lisbon Treaty, changed this power balance drastically. These core countries' power went up to something like uh, 33%. Uh, <clears throat> Brexit, while well, changing things even further, obviously the former Aftons lost a lot of their former influence, but these uh, central countries um, increased their influence even further, and uh, uh, Eastern Europe, including Hungary, lost uh, some of the power. Uh, if you want to look at uh, Hungary's situation in particular, what we find is that, and please look at the scale on the right. So previously we had, before Lisbon, we had about three and a half percent influence in decision-making. And after Lisbon, this went down to about 2.2%. Uh, so a decrease of some 50%. Uh, and due to decreasing population, um, this is expected to go down uh, to about 2% uh, in, uh, in a half a century. Despite all these, um, and I'm sure the Lisbon Treaty had other aspects which were more favorable to us, Hungary was the first country to ratify uh, the Lisbon Treaty, despite uh, being one of the uh, countries that lost most in terms of influence uh, in the voting mechanism. So if you look at the two uh, effects uh, at a country level, we can see that the Lisbon Treaty um, benefited the smallest countries and, so, and the largest countries, while for medium-sized countries, the effect was uh, uh, more uh, negative. Um, in addition to that, countries with a decreasing population, which is pretty much the case for uh, Eastern Europe, for most countries in Eastern Europe, um, uh, that was an additional um, uh, decrease uh, in the somewhat longer run. So if you put all these together, it turns out that the, the country that lost most was the Czech Republic, then Hungary, and then Bulgaria um, in this order. If you look at Brexit, Brexit benefited the largest countries, especially the four largest, Poland also a little bit, and harmed everybody um, that was a smaller, um, um, further um, reducing uh, the influence of Eastern Europe, if Eastern Europe um, within the European Union. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide and let's talk about something that uh, I haven't mentioned before. Uh, in these uh, models, we never talked about who votes with whom. So some people say that uh, the departure of uh, the United Kingdom has almost no effect on EU decision makers because they always said no to everything. Well, I don't know if this is true, but certainly um, there are natural alliances among certain groups of, uh, of countries or voters in general. So in the next model, we consider a situation where you take this into account as well. So what we see on this, uh, in this plot here, each uh, dot is a player um, with two characteristics, um, which we believe um, expresses how, how they are going to vote on certain issues. And once we know the location of um, the different voters in this, what we call a, a policy space, then we can consider coalitions. We're going to consider coalitions which correspond to rectangles uh, with the idea if uh, some of the, the players find uh, the extremal positions within this rectangle, so this more Northern, the more Southern and, and uh, also Eastern position, the most Western position, then those uh, who are intermediate to these extrema uh, will be naturally voting in the same way, okay? So on the other hand, we do not consider these kind of uh, coalitions, which have the same number of players. So probably they have a, a, they pass the required majority requirement. But on the other hand, this player should normally be uh, with them. And in that case, the coalition would be too large already uh, in a sense uh, that players on the on the borderline will not be swing uh, anymore. So we are going to talk, uh, we will refer to these as convex uh, coalitions, that these are concave coalitions and we are, we are focusing on convex coalitions. Okay, now as a first, as a, as a kind of a toy project, we looked at um, the latest conclave 
to elect uh, the new uh, bishop of Rome, so the new uh, pope. Um, each dot represents one of the cardinals according to two aspects which seemed important at the time and seemed decisive at the time on electing the new pope. One of them is whether the pope is going to be conservative or perhaps uh, we have um, uh, a liberal pope uh, for a change. The other aspect was that after two uh, European but non-Italian popes, does the crown go back to uh, Italy and perhaps are we going to have an Italian pope or some people were talking about perhaps a black pope or, or somebody uh, from overseas in general. So the next, uh, so the other um, dimension was uh, the distance of the place of origin for each of the um, cardinals measured from, from the city of Rome. Okay, so what we see here is, as I said, each dot corresponds to a, a cardinal, and what we see is uh, this coloring indicates how influential they would be, according to such a model, in deciding who becomes the new uh, pope. And we assume that, or I understand that the cardinals typically don't lobby to become a, a pope, but suppose they do, let's just play with this idea for the moment, um, then those with the highest influence are most likely to get elected. One surprising thing, and then I'll show you where are some of the well-known cardinals, is that those right in the center, like Tarkson, have almost no chance to get elected because they always end up in the middle of, of these rectangles, or these rectangles, sorry. Um, and the most interesting ones, the, the, the more influential ones are those on the kind of the periphery, not the very periphery, but kind of extreme in one aspect of the of the two measures that we are looking for. And the model actually works surprisingly well. So Bergoglio, uh, the current Pope Francis, came number three according to our model. Uh, while uh, I think many people in Hungary were very hopeful that uh, Peter Erdő was a strong candidate because he was uh, he's considered a very uh, bright person, very popular, very moderate, everybody likes him. But according to this model, he was only 104th out of the 115 uh, Papa Billy. So um, now let's turn into something uh, uh, more uh, practical and more actual. Um, we have looked at one of the committees of the European Parliament, in particular because one of my co-authors is uh, interested in uh, agriculture economics, we looked at the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development. So the first part of the, the slides will deal with the 2014 to 2019 um, uh, period, and then I'll show you some figure about the, 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 the more recent one. So what we see here first is um, each member of this committee plotted according to a left-right index, and the other dimension is their affinity towards agriculture, measured by the percentage of agricultural employment in their home region. So the idea was that somebody living in uh, central London might, might have a very different uh, idea than somebody living in, in rural Hungary or, or in Romania or something like that. Uh, the colors indicate the different party groups. Um, now let's see how what kind of power they would have in this, this model. Again, the same kind of a coloring. Again, what we see is that the central uh, players uh, do not have uh, too much influence, and some some of those further away, um, we could say they are radical in some sense, um, have a have a, a more influence. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, voting in this uh, in this committee is not as straightforward as what we would see from this picture, because people are sometimes so members are are sometimes absent. When somebody is absent, then a substitute comes to vote in place. So in the next model, we used a, a complex Monte Carlo simulation that's so much for uh, not talking about casino. So this is a, a, basically a, a model where we randomly select uh, who are present based on their attendance statistics from this period. Uh, then again, we also look at the, can, the, the substitutes, what is their probability of uh, being present. And then uh, now with this more complicated model, more complex model, taking all the players into account, um, we can calculate the influence of the different actors. 
Um, well, the model, so the picture changes uh, uh, in two ways. Um, one of them is that we see these smaller dots, bigger dots. The size of a dot indicates uh, the participation rate. So the bigger, uh, the, the more likely that they were present in a particular voting. And it is quite clear that um, if you are not there too often, then your influence will be uh, uh, smaller. But other than that, because of that, you know, there is some kind of, uh, uh, it's more like a patchwork. So you see uh, a, a lighter color in the middle of a darker spot, um, uh, but that's because of, uh, because of being absent more often. Okay, so if we would actually perhaps, uh, I just go back for a second. Um, one problem with this picture is that there are areas which are really crowded. So there are a lot of people in, in, in here or here while there's a big uh, gap here. Uh, as a matter of fact, what we are interested in is the order of the different um, uh, voters in uh, different aspects. So what, I, what we did here is instead of the actual numbers, these are their ordinal positions according to the different aspects. And now we see it a little bit better that we have this lighter blue area in the center. And those who are um, perhaps have a more radical opinions in one dimension are, are, are more influential. In fact, this is something that um, we have found in general. Um, we are still working on, on, uh, on general data, but our mathematical model uh, suggests this, that if we have this two-dimensional policy space, which is actually quite interesting because uh, um, 50 years ago, everything was simple in politics. You had left and right and everything was one dimensional uh, with the arrival of uh, liberals and, uh, and also some radical parties this opened up in, in different dimension. And then it seems that uh, the most influential uh, uh, players are not central players anymore, but those who are taking an extreme position in one aspect. Notice, not those who are taking extreme positions in both aspects, they have as little influence as those in the center, but in one aspect. Um, I think it's quite interesting to evaluate what is the influence of the different players in a committee, uh, who, who makes uh, really the, deci the, the decisions, and perhaps also who to delegate uh, if, you, if you want to achieve uh, influence um, in, in, in such a setting. Now, just for a moment, obviously we do not have a reliable presence data yet for the for the current uh, committee, and I'm sorry the, the quality of this figure is not so good, um, but this is still a kind of work in progress. What we do see is that the same uh, pattern emerges that those in the center have less influence and those on the periphery um, uh, make decisions uh, uh, more often. All right, so this is uh, where I would like to end my, uh, my presentation. Just a quick summary, especially the first part. So if you are in a conflict situation, it is sometimes worth to write down the game. Try to understand what are your own motives and what are the motives of the other party. Um, in order to do this, you have to identify the available strategies. Keep it simple. Think of two, three strategies at most and identify the payoffs, or at least uh, how would you uh, quantify the outcomes that are possible. What is very important is try to think as the other player. What would the other player do? Um, I, I very often see people you know, label others completely crazy for doing what they do, despite the fact that they did exactly what was in their own interest. And uh, after all, it, I mean, in a non-cooperative a non-cooperative game, this is actually what, what only matters. Is there an equilibrium in the game? What happens in the equilibrium? Is it good for us or not good for us? If we, if we don't like the equilibrium, we cannot really um, get rid of the equilibrium. I mean, this is, this is pretty much what is going to happen in the game. But perhaps by changing the game a little bit, we might be able to achieve something better. You're negotiating with something. If you are negotiating at Istanbul in the bazaar, uh, you can't get a good price. Maybe you buy also something else. That's a win-win for both parties, and then perhaps an agreement is reached. Okay, thank you much for the attention. As a, on the last slide, uh, I'm recommending two books that could be interesting for those uh, uh, interested in game theory. First is just a book on the history of game theory, and second has fascinating stories, which are really fun to read. Um, if you have uh, further questions or interested in further literature, do, do contact me at my uh, uh, email address. I have a blog, unfortunately, in Hungarian, and I don't write too often, but uh, 
still you can find some interesting stuff and the the locations or the web addresses of of my uh, two uh, research groups one is the game theory research group at the uh, center of economic and regional studies and the other one at technical university Budapest. thank you very much for your attention dear professor Kozis, thank you very much for this nice presentation uh, until we would potentially get some questions via Facebook and some external sources, I would like to ask my colleagues present here whether they would have some question. Dear Ambassador, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kotze. It was really uh, very interesting. I never thought that uh, you know bluffing and uh, politics or diplomacy uh, would come to the same uh, page uh, ever uh, in our discussions, of course. Uh, of course not, yeah. <laughs> Uh, of course, it would never happen, uh, but this was really fascinating and it's really uh, uh, tempting to ask many, many questions, but I will only ask one, uh, and that is, um, um, I mean, it was very interesting, uh, you know, also in historical trends, and you mentioned the Lisbon uh, Treaty and how it changed uh, various influences, uh, so this seems uh, like something that could really be instrumentalized or uh, make it, making it operative for, for those who are um, uh, this is uh, a daily job. Uh, do I mean, is this a potential application that um, um, you know countries and uh, decision makers are uh, looking at, or this is more uh, sort of an academic uh, matter, or are they really looking at this uh, from the approach of uh, uh, let's let's see the the mathematics and the science behind it? I think there's no, uh, thank you very much for the question, first of all. Um, I think there's no general answer to this. So I think uh, from country to country, the, the uh, attitude is a little bit different. So I mentioned this Yagelo compromise, which was a, a, a model developed by math, math, mathematicians uh, and I think physicists who, according to, so this model determined what should be the weight of every country. By the way, it should be proportional to the square root of their population. And uh, there is some mathematical result that shows that assuming that the countries are democracies, uh, this is how um, uh, each member of this country, each uh, citizen of, uh, of a member state would have the same kind of influence on decisions. Um, Poland for a while pressed for uh, this proposal and they were trying to get uh, other supporters. I think the Czech Republic uh, was interested for a while but somehow this mathematical model didn't uh, catch on with others. So I would say in this case, certainly Poland um, did consult uh, um, theorists and, and uh, academics um, on this issue. Now, if, if I look at the academic literature, uh, I can see that there are certain uh, countries where um, the literature was, was more focused on this problem. Uh, I would name uh, the United Kingdom, uh, and, uh, and the Netherlands, for sure, as two countries where they have extensively published on this issue. And I think in the papers written by uh, Dutch authors, the, the issue of uh, uh, the Netherlands versus Belgium uh, comes up uh, um, uh, regularly. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is uh, due to the fact that these countries had scholars who were specialized in these fields. And as a matter of fact, I think both the UK and uh, and the Netherlands are uh, quite research intensive countries. Um, but the same thing doesn't appear in other countries uh, for, for, for sure. So same kind of uh, evaluation of the policies uh, I, I, I don't see in other countries. I hope this is going to change. So um, I do not want to go into details, but we are now making also an effort to, to uh, present uh, quantitative models to um, to government, government agencies, uh, to, to, to make a better use of the available academic results in, in, in policy making, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm sure similar efforts are made in other countries. Um, actually, one uh, simple story, it's, it's happened in Belgium while I was uh, still a PhD student, but I must say it was at the EU um, um, uh, headquarters. Um, we visited uh, um, a research group of the European Union that was uh, that had the main task of predicting uh, macroeconomic ac economic trends such as inflation, GDPs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've seen a very uh, colorful, interesting presentation by one of the researchers working there. 
So after the presentation finished, inst instead of an applause, there was a dead silence. Um, and one of the professors asked, so why are you using these 50, 60 year old models? So if a first year student would come up with this to solve the simplest problem, I would you know, kick him out of my office. I said, well, if we would use more complicated models, nobody would understand. So uh, that's, that's actually an aspect that, um, that is, I think, difficult to overcome. So indeed, sometimes if you reach for more complicated models, it is very difficult to explain uh, uh, to decision makers what is actually happening in the model and why, why this perhaps surprising result uh, uh, came out. So to some extent, the decision makers don't need to understand uh, every part of the model, but, but the main lines they should be, I think, um, um, clear about. Um, and I'm, I'm, as a matter of fact, these, uh, these models that I presented are, I think, not uh, rocket science. They're not too complicated, but there are some aspects which are uh, a little bit abstract. And I think this can sometimes um, make them a bit more difficult to digest. Thank you very much. I, I will only uh, follow up with a very provocative one. Uh, uh, I was, and that's more like a rhetorical question. Uh, when are you, when you're pitching uh, these ideas to government agencies, are you suggesting cooperative or no, non-cooperative uh, partners? Because I guess uh, you can find uh, both, and and I guess uh, there are also a lot of people who, uh, uh, I mean, it's it's also a matter of beliefs. I think uh, that you think that uh, politics or diplomacy or international affairs is. Uh, uh, whether it's an art or, or a science. And I guess those who believe that it's uh, at least part science uh, would be very much interested in uh, hearing uh, the practical applications that you propose. Uh, personally, I'm very grateful for tonight's lecture. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Matra, do you have any question to the current lecture? Yes, I do. And I would like to uh, continue uh, where uh, Tamás left it. And so, <clears throat> sorry, I would like to ask about the robustness and uh, the dynamics of these strategies. And um, I mean, how um, is it always possible to, to find a strategy that is fairly independent from the behavior or the psychological predisposition of the participants and would kind of work um, more or less independently from, from these characteristics of the participants and if you have a mixed situation, which is maybe somehow a mixture of a, a cooperative or a non-cooperative uh, uh, situation, how do you, I mean, do we know anything about the dynamics when you change from one strategy to another that you can still make something out of the situation? Is there any optimum, optimal moment that you can recognize as, as a key moment of changing a strategy? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. These are very complicated questions, I have to say. So, <clears throat> and then sometimes it's a bit difficult to answer. So I must say that the models I have presented are all static models. In fact, uh, the prisoner's dilemma is a one-time interaction. So the whole story changes if you are talking about, uh, for instance, career criminals who would uh, end up in a similar situation uh, every few years, and therefore their uh, future collaboration depends on how they act in this situation. And if they value future cooperation highly, of course, they do not want to talk and they might end up in a good uh, outcome of the prisoner's dilemma. So this is already a, a completely different conclusion just because we introduced some kind of a dynamics. We, we, we consider long-term relationship. Um, <clears throat> we, as, as a standard assumption in these games, we assume players are rational, but even that is not completely clear and should not be taken for granted. Let me just give you one simple game that has been studied, the so-called ultimatum game. And this is an experiment that has been played probably thousands and thousands of times uh, in different settings uh, since it was first introduced. So the idea is that one of the persons, let's call um, uh, it's, it's a him, uh, it's an A, um, gets some money and let's say 100 euros and can choose how to divide this money between himself and the second player, B, okay? Um, so for example, one possibility is that he keeps 90% and gives her only 10%, so 90 euros, 10 euros. But then B can decide whether she accepts the, the, the current allocation. Uh, if she says no, then nobody gets anything. 
If she says yes, then they can keep the division as, uh, as it was decided by, by player A. Now, uh, you could think if uh, both players were fully rational and we talk about a one-time interaction and they will never meet again, that if he uh, splits the money as 90 to himself and 10 to, the, uh, 10 to her, that she should accept it, right? It's like free 10 euros. I mean, uh, uh, it's maybe not a big sum, but you can still buy something. But in practice, this is not what we see. So in, in the experiments, what they found is that um, unless the proposal is around half-half, it gets rejected. OK? So this doesn't make sense at all. But it seems that people are willing to pay to educate people, even a, situ even a complete stranger, to somebody they will never meet again. They want to educate that person and are willing to lose money to do that. And uh, it's quite interesting that also culturally this is very different because in uh, they've done this experiment with uh, uh, American Indians living in the the, the Andes and uh, uh, where where nuclear families are the only ones cooperating and basically they are separated by by very high mountains from each other so therefore there's absolutely no collaboration between different families but in that case even a small amount was accepted because uh, that's, a, that's a gesture nobody ever expects from a stranger. But in the, in the European culture, it's about 50-50. So again, this is something that is a bit irrational. And in fact, there's a now whole uh, stream of literature and then I can uh, mention Thaler who got the Nobel Prize also a few years ago for his work in that behavioral economics. So that you can see this as a, as a branch of, uh, well, stemming from game theory perhaps, but uh, with, looking at situations where this full rationality is not assumed. And in fact, I mean, this is used widely in, uh, in practice um, when um, you get this letter that uh, you should do this and this because 95% or 60% of people do this. Well, you feel the pressure already. Uh, behavioral economics studies these kind of models and how to change uh, behavior, hopefully to the better. Um, so, I have to say that um, very often, even the very simple models give us at least a good intuition of how, how a certain conflict would uh, develop. We could uh, make the model richer by, cons by considering dynamics, um, <clears throat> both in, you know, in time, um, we, we could consider multiple interactions, a change in game, et cetera, et cetera. We could consider how, how irrational players are sometimes. Well, these make much more complicated models and sometimes too difficult models that are too difficult to solve. Um, but um, but we, do not we do not necessarily gain that much in terms of insight. So sometimes the simple models are, are, are informative enough. OK, thank you. Um, yes, Peter. Uh, dear professor, do you know that actually uh, general directors uh, in agricultural brand or in any other parts of EU, do you use the help of uh, mathematicians, theoretic, theoretical mathematicians to predict their decisions? Uh, do they apply advisors with mathematical background in game, game theory? I think it's a difficult question. Um, I think uh, those are often trade secrets, so I, 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 I cannot uh, really know as a matter of fact. Um, well, let me just uh, give you two things that, uh, uh, so one, one, once I was at a conference where there was a very interesting uh, presentation by a representative of a leading brand. Um, and basically they said that if you, if you go to YouTube, I think uh, I, cannot, I can't say this brand because it has been mentioned uh, before you watch this video uh, and afterwards, YouTube is going to recommend you several videos using very complex algorithms, um, helping your decisions with, uh, as I said, in a way, high level mathematics um, to make sure that you spend your next five minutes in a useful way. But at the same time, much more uh, major decisions like where should you go to college what kind of a professions you, should you choose are often not supported by, by uh, even the most basic uh, algorithm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid a little bit that uh, even uh, in large companies, sometimes decisions are made in an ad hoc way. I'm sure there are uh, you know, leaders who have simply good instincts in, in leading such companies. Uh, and they're not using these models. 
But on the other hand, I should think that game theory and other quantitative methods are used more and more often uh, to solve this, to, to help these kind of decisions. So, I mean, uh, perhaps this is not the best application, but the other example I would like to say is, uh, you know, things like uh, in sports, uh, you would be surprised how much game theory is used in sports. So sometimes, uh, you know, the examples that they mention is that I think in, in Formula One, I think at least one uh, championship, championship was decided when uh, they were, there was some kind of an event in the, in the race. And then I think a decision had to be made in five seconds, but the computer program was running. It was evaluating uh, probabilities and, uh, you know, the success. Of, it's also an answer to the young for the question. So in a dynamic way, uh, what, what, is, what is the better strategy? And because of that, they, they made a very uh, somewhat uh, unexpected move. And this turned out to be successful and, uh, and the driver uh, won the, the championship. So I should think if these things are used in sports, I, I think they are even more used in the business life. Uh, but if so, we wouldn't know, most probably. To be honest, I would be very happy to use this theory in a medical information uh, collection, especially for big data. We are collecting tremendous amount of samples, uh, which for we don't know the best strategy. So we know actually um uh, some intuitive way how to collect samples i would be very happy to encourage you to collaborate with the medical field and with the big data collection in different omics dear professor thank you very much for your contribution and uh, ladies and gentlemen our historical milestone program the 40s lecture which actually started with some technical difficulties is ending uh, i would like to thank to professor kozi for accepting our invitation I am convinced uh, we not only enjoy the popular science, but we also got a bit familiarized with uh, this interesting field of applied mathematics, which has many Hungarian connotations. I am also grateful to the ambassador for his laudation of the speaker and for endless support of our initiatives. We are very grateful to the co-workers of Hungarian Cultural Center, namely Boroka Tokac, Csaba Bartos, and Miklos Szörényi for providing once again uh, technical help in difficult situations, and I wish you a peaceful night. Thank you very much.